um, all the information on the slide. Um, so our community is in decline. This is the weekly project usage of Drupal for just the past five years, and it has leveled off. Um, and Drupal 8 is, is sort of a blip um, on, on what has been adopted so far. And this has been recognized, and that's why there is, um, you know, the major, one of the major initiatives right now is to make installing it easily to uh, stop that barrier to entry. And we'll revisit that approach there. But, you know, so, so Drupal is a bit in, in decline. I mean, it's not the end of the world. After all, it's not like the rest of the world is suffering from division, disaster, capitalism, and impending doom. Oh, all right. Um, all right, well, what if this sort of unique and cool community thing that we do still have going is as good a shot as we've got? What if we are the hero we need to see? Um, last image was a burning planet, um, and this image is a, a Drupal conned superhero. Um, so, you know, you know, on average as a community, we've got plus six cooperation, maybe a technical challenge bonus. Um, for building an inclusive community, maybe a negative one. We'll revisit that too. Um, making software that connects people and resources, we've got a little slight edge there. Um, but before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's see what we are up against. Uh, this is from the XKCD comic. It shows a line moving slightly from the left to the right. Um, this is what rapid change on a geological time scale looks like. Uh, degree Celsius, or a couple degrees Fahrenheit, changing over a thousand years. Uh, in today's anthropogenic era of human-caused global warming, we've added more than a degree Celsius with more than two, that's more than two degrees Fahrenheit in less than 100 years, with most of that coming in the last 25. And the graph shows that line shooting way rapidly um, off from the average to uh, increasingly hot at a rate that you, know, you don't see in any of the geologic errors. Um, and you know, this is a couple years old. You can increase that solid black line just a little on the current path, the worst path, um, because we've done nothing to stop it. Um, we're causing warming to define a geological era in our lifetimes. Um, but you can imagine a similar line uh, for the ozone layer, and public action has pushed us closer to the best case scenario. Acid rain, maybe more like the optimistic scenario, but um, there are major, major things that we have succeeded. Um, we're still up against the basic problem in political science. There's the classic problem of a concentrated benefit and distributed cost. Um, this is oil workers cleaning up, uh, and, uh, people in white suits cleaning up an oil spill. And um, you know, it's, it's from an article that makes the point that uh, cleaning up an oil spill is pretty theatrical. There's not much you can do without a dedication of like hundreds of times the resource that it actually is. Um, but you know, the point is that a, very, a relatively few people are benefiting a great deal from various forms of environmental destruction, and the cost is distributed to everyone. And as long as you have a small group with a high stakes and a much larger group with a cumulatively higher stakes but individually lower stakes, um, typically in political events, the group with the small group with the concentrated higher stakes uh, gets what they want, and everyone else suffers. Um, but the solution is communication, coordination tools, and networks capable of giving the distributed many the same degree of power to discuss, decide, and direct organizational power as the concentrated few. Um, that extreme wealth correlates with interests that run against uh, humanity's interests as a whole, you know, adds just an extra challenge to that. Um, this is a chart showing uh, U.S. wealth distributions, uh, the perception people have of it. Um, what they think it is is that, you know, the bottom, you know, the poorest 20% of people have like 5% of the wealth, and then next 20, you know, have, you know, 10 or something like that, and then the middle 20 maybe gets 20 um, for themselves. Um, 
and what 92% think should be the ideal going well into, you know, even, even if all of the richest think that they should have as much wealth as possible, there's still, um, by 92% choosing an ideal that is uh, far more equal than they think it is, even among the top 20% wealthiest people, um, a majority of them <laughs> are, are calling, or think that wealth should be more equal than it is. Um, but that's what people think the wealth distribution, what the wealth distribution actually is, is the top 20% have 80%, <laughs> um, and the bottom, the, the bottom 40% is, you know, you can't even have separate lines anymore. It's just a tiny, tiny sliver at the bottom. And so if you take the full, you know, the majority of the population, 60% of the population, um, it's, you know, down there just like 10% of the, the chart. Um, so most of the wealth extracted from, say, burning fossil fuels, um, uh, where you know, we as a society have been burning as if it's a magic consequence free source of energy. Uh, most of that wealth has probably been wasted. A lot was made. Um, certainly there's a lot of wealth out there. But like if I you know, burn down a store while stealing $100 from a cash register, I've destroyed a lot more wealth than I've taken. So it's just because uh, something has been done doesn't mean wealth was necessarily made out of it. Um, but still the baseline of justice in a narrow, even that narrow sense is I give that $100 back in restitution. Um, and as Utah, but as Utah Phillips says, the earth is not dying, it's being killed, and those who are killing it have names and addresses. Um, so it's just that there is resources out there to solve the problems we have, and it's good to know where they are. Um, but, you know, now that you know how extreme wealth inequality is, do you have the power to do anything about it? Not in itself. Knowledge is not power. Um, Miriam Kaba, uh, organizer on prison culture on Twitter, highly knowledgeable on the subject of organizing and has been working on ending violence and dismantling the prison industrial complex, you know, has made that point many times that organization is power, which brings me to Drupal as a service. Um, <laughs> I am triply excited about building Drupal as a service, build b Drupal businesses that provide software as a service, um, especially companies uh, as a platform uh, especially building these companies as platform cooperatives, as companies that are owned by a large, you know, the, the people they serve, essentially, rather than being owned by a narrow group of investors that, uh, you know, these platform businesses that we're all using every day um, be formed as cooperatives. And the, the triple benefit is that, um, you know, Drupal and related technology that work on does give us power to coordinate, Building it is an exercise in coordination itself, and as cooperatives, we'll need to build even more tech to work on um, mass coordination. Um, so, Drupal as a service is a, you know, would be a subset of, is a subset of LibreSAS. Um, it's free software as a service, Libre software as a service. Uh, LibreSAS is a term I coined, but someone else coined it independently, so it's like totally a movement now. Um, every cloud service, every software as a service, all the big platforms you can think of are almost invariably built on a mostly free software stack. Uh, the operating system, the server, the programming languages, the databases, the libraries, um, all of it. Even if they're open sourcing it themselves, most of um, you know, name it big tech company, the majority of their software is running on a free software stack. Um, and they're making piles of money on a relatively thin slice of proprietary code um, that's pulling it all together. And the question is, why can't free Libre open source software move into that space? And the good news is, it is. Uh, Drupal is already doing it. Um, Centaro, which is uh, commerce guys rebranding themselves, as they move to offering software as a service. Um, launched officially yesterday, the rebrand. Um, and they're taking especially tricky bits of commerce that you, you know, might not want running on your own site um, into a service they run. And Ryan Sarma encapsulated LibreSAS beautifully when he said that in addition to the no lock-in benefit of doing fully GPL software um, the promise of greater collaboration 
is why they are especially um, excited to be doing it entirely as, um, as, as LibreSAS instead of doing a proprietary software as a service, which is a pretty common model of having some pieces open source and then trying to keep um, some, some pieces held back. Um, but the benefits of collaborating with the people they serve and other companies and then the, the, uh, you know, the appeal to um, companies that would be purchasing the service of not being locked in uh, are sort of competitive advantages. Um, also in Drupal World, uh, Round Earth uh, by MyDrop Wizard is a combination of, uh, uh, of, of Drupal and Civi CRM to provide both the content relationship management system and the um, content management system. And that's in, I think, their second beta right now, or second cohort. Um, Open Social by Gold Gorilla with the, uh, um, is, was a uh, piece of software that they, um, that, that they adopted from the a Drupal 7 version that they'd done for a very large activist, um, not-for-profit group. Um, and as they say, it's software to empower people to effectively collaborate and organize, uh, replacing traditional intranets, um, fueling bottom-up organizational innovation. So taking something they did for one client and trying to make a service out of it. And it's been an effort for a while. Uh, Roomify um, is a booking engine that partly provides a software as a service. Um, Probo CI is not Drupal per se, but it's uh, from a long-term Drupal company, Zivtech. Um, not pictured, Farmier.com is uh, uh, the online hosted uh, accompaniment for the Farmier distribution for farmers, um, but it's Farmier with an I in it. Um, it's built on Drupal 7, and they just released their 1.0. And then Open Church Site, or Open Church um, Distribution, and the website is openchurchsite.com, um, has recently launched a Drupal version. But overall, on the web, um, as Dries Beutert um, had said way back in 2015, walled gardens, so talking about Facebook and Google and LinkedIn, anything that tries to keep you in their sphere, the walled gardens are winning um, because they have a superior user experience fueled by data and technical capabilities not easily available to their competitors, including the open web. Um, and is despite the fact that on most of these networks, um, you know, we are the network, the people on them are creating the value. Uh, but open platforms have disadvantages to close largely in making upfront investments. Um, with one entity controlling a platform, they can capture that value more easily, just get a ton of venture capital and lose money for a long time before they uh, turn a profit that's not as easy when you don't have that guarantee of um, being able to basically have monopoly rates once you capture the network effect if you are truly being open. Um, so, um, but open platforms can have advantages over closed. Um, the image here is Indie Web Camp. Um, IndieWebCamp.org or IndieWeb.org is a collection of a movement. And this is just one, one small piece of a much larger movement. Um, for there to be an open web, they take an approach of, you know, simple protocols uh, to try to start to allow the sort of interaction you get in closed proprietary environments like Facebook, like Twitter, um, on distributed sites. And uh, Drupal user Swento has made a fantastic indie web module for Drupal 8. Um, and just in the broader open web versus closed web um, conflict, um, there is, um, you know, the, the longer view is that government regulators are increasingly going to be exercising oversight over the data collection and some of the anti-competitive business models of the you know, closed 
um, but very large uh, silos. Um, and Dries's latest blog post writes about that. Um, Shoshana Zubikov has a whole book out um, called Surveillance Capitalism and the new um, form there, and she likens it to past movements to rein in, um, uh, rein in, you know, out of control, um, you know, basically capitalism, um, and, you know, successfully when people identified themselves as, as workers, as laborers, there, you know, wasn't generally revolution, but there was enough of a, a understanding of a, of a common interest that, um, you know, got the, you know, got representation, got governments to take their power, I mean, really increased the realm of what a citizenship was. And now she thinks that there will be a consciousness of people as, um, you know, as, as citizens, as citizens online, that will also have a, an effect, a common consciousness. And certainly people are being pushing back more against the data collection and all of that. So there's, there's this opening for, um, for potentially for cooperative platforms. So going back to Drupal and the, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, the, the health and growth of the community, um, you know, this slide has been used forever, and um, it was, it's a ripoff of, uh, of a, um, it, was, it was not originally Drupal, it was like a, a bunch of, you know, different games, but it's the learning curve, um, and Drupal is the learning curve that goes up, straight up in a cliff and veers out, and people are hanging off it and falling. Um, but the important thing is that at the time, despite the way this, you know, joke graph is drawn, um, the getting started with Drupal step was not actually so much higher than other things out there. And now we are in a, in a place where, um, you know, the getting started step for any software that you have to install is vastly higher than going to Squarespace or WordPress.com, um, and this is where having um, ex, you know entry-level accessible software as a service options I think is necessary for the health of the Drupal community um, because it is how people can um, can get in and um, and and start contributing. It's like it's you know I you know personal story I first tried Drupal in 2004, I think, and, or 2005 maybe, whenever it was, the, the better known branding of Drupal was actually a thing called Civic Space, which ironically did try later to do software as a service, did not work out, um, but it was a different time. Um, but they bundled Civic CRM and, and Drupal, and I tried to install that locally, and it, you know, needed so much RAM that it just crashed my thing. I'm like, well, if I can't visit the, you know, and this was also back when mo all of the modules loaded when you went to the admin modules page rather than just loading the info file. And so <laughs> it crashed my whole system, you know, crashed, you know, the whole website. And I'm like, well, if, if it can't handle one visitor, how is this thing ever going to work on a, on a website? And so I was stayed away from, from Drupal for another year because I happened to come to it first through the, uh, the, the civic space, CRM, Civi CRM and Drupal combined version. Um, that was just you know, too heavy to get started with. And Drupal 8 is sort of like that because to do it right, you use Composer and Composer is probably gonna use up all of your RAM now. Um, so you know, having online services that, that you know, give you the site builder experience, which is how many people who even later got into development started, is, is critical to you know, both giving the power of Drupal to everyone who can benefit from it, but also bringing in the, the new generation and, and you know, people who are not currently in the community. And it's important to have people who um, aren't already in your community who represent um, broader um, 
representation, especially if we are going to try to seriously do our part as a community to take on some of the things that are out there, like global warming, like surveillance capitalism, the big things. Um, because for surveillance, um, this has been a state um, for, the, um, in the United States especially, black people, and in many places, just anyone who's more marginalized, who is basically targeted by the government and other powers um, as a threat to the status quo. So basically anyone who is not doing as well as other people is a threat to the status quo if, because there's a danger that they'll you know, fight for justice. Um, and so um, you know, the kind of mass surveillance that we are facing as a society um, has already been the case for communities in our society. Um, and you know, very similar to also you know, people who uh, get you know, government benefits as, um, as, that are targeted to the poor versus government benefits targeted at the rich have all kinds of intrusive surveillance, whereas you, know, you just get handed your you know, tax deduction or tax credit for having a, a fake farm on your golf course, uh, for example. Um, and I do want to leave time for questions. Um, so I think I'm coming up on five minutes left. Um, so I will just move to the end. Um, but just in uh, closing, um, the um, the one project that we're that uh, I'm involved in is is trying to make a, a Drupal as a service that does give that entry level for smaller groups, it's Drutopia, um, and trying to take on some of the, the bigger questions of how to direct resources to those who need it, those who you know, know some of the, the, the you know, problems that we're dealing with, feel them more acutely, and, uh, and are, you know, we should be taking leadership in how to organize. Um, so um, I will be putting up all resources and links up here. They're not up there yet. Um, and also, uh, please go to the event schedule and go to this to rate the session. That's too long a URL, sorry, for uh, to be easy. I'll link it from, from the short URL also. Um, so thank you. So I've read, um, I think I agree with the idea that, um, so multi-tenant SaaS products versus single-tenant SaaS products, right? Um, the idea that uh, you can build a multi-site Drupal instance where the configuration between customers uh, is the wall that hides the data between customers versus a single tenant where you're building a distribution and that distribution is what's turned on per client, yada, yada. So they basically completely handle and have their own full instance of Drupal, which I think I lean towards. Um, curious, do you yes. have any <laughs> practical resources for building a distribution um, where the, the, the thing I'm chewing on, the, thing, the problem that I have is how do we handle configuration management custom There's to that instance? There's an initiative for that, that too. Instance. Okay, good, this is great. Good, okay, so custom to that instance, configuration management, right? So configure split helps us with that significantly, right? We've got, uh, you know, configuration for development, configuration that we're um, pushing toward that central project, right, the distribution. But what about configuration on a per customer basis? Any ideas? Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head. And I mean, yeah, it's been sort of the a central preoccupation of Drutopia from the beginning. I mean, the, the good news is that Drupal as a whole is sort of recognizing that need, that um, we've solved the configuration from a single site, you know, going from dev to test to prod. That's fantastic. 
Um, but then when you want to be able to push out updates from your, um, your central, um, yeah, fr from, from your distribution um, and still allow customizations, um, it gets a little tricky. So right now we're using um, config distro, which is building on config split, I think, and a million other things. Um, it, but it looks like something like config overlay, which, which will save only the changes for a specific site is gonna be a lot cleaner, because then you're, you basically commit like just what you're gonna override on that individual site um, with that. So it's essentially not a solved problem, but it is a solvable problem for sure, and it is one that um, a lot of work is being done, and it is, and that is, you know, the Configuration 2.0 initiative isn't necessarily chartered to solve that, but that specific problem, but there, it's, it's highly on the radar, and the Configuration 2.0 initiative is supposed to make it easier to solve this problem. And I, you know, do trust that Willis, but yeah, that is the sort of key technical issue, and then the fact that it's harder to, um, you know, share the, the PHP code base, the idea is like, yeah, the code is locked down. It's like you can choose from these modules, but you can't add other things when you're doing Drupal as a service in the multi-tenant model, like you said, or the single-tenant module or model on many things. Um, but uh, um, but yeah, right now, right now, you can't even like share the PHP in an op cache, but that's sort of a scale issue. Like, okay, we'll figure that out when it grows. And then the other thing is, um, you know, building Drupal in a more headless fashion. I'm really excited by the Hacks project, um, which, you know, replaces a lot of the front end and would sort of make it possible for you to just power down the Drupal site um, when you're not using it or, you know, even using something like Tome when you're dealing with more simple sites. So, you know, for our end of looking for, like, you know, being able to serve um, relatively low resource groups, we're looking at all of those things. For a lot of services, like, that's not going to be important because the value that you know the Drupal site is providing is enough to keep it running all the time with as much resources as it needs. But then you know the key thing you brought up of the configuration is that not solved, but there's many initiatives. I mean, there's the core initiative that's improving all the options, and then there's already a bunch of things that are sort of offering that option. Um, yeah, thank you. I think we're at time, but if any other questions, I will take them. Thank you.